Hello everyone, me again. Today I've got a fairly short video again, um, and this time we are going to be taking a look at how we might handle things that we buy uh, from a stockist or a, you know, another supplier. Um, so very much off the shelf items, um, and how we might handle these in both technical structures and power fab. Um, for the demonstration or for the purposes of this example, I'm going to use a ball standard. Okay, so we've got um, we've got the two blanks, we've got a couple of balls and a base plate. And what Tecla Structures users might tend to do is to draw all the elements and then weld them together and then treat them as an assembly. Um, the disadvantage here is that Tecla Structures is treating each of those parts as a part as it normally would. So in any material list or any drawing list um, and in PowerFab you're going to get um, and a main assembly but you're going to get all those items called off individually. Um, so let me give you an example of what I mean. Um, so let's go across to the organizer um, and we'll have a look at the content of this item. So once that opens and synchronizes, um, we'll, be, we'll be there. So let's synchronize that and let's have a look at these parts. Um, so let's have a look at these steel parts. You can see that we've got one line and we've got a ball standard and it's position number ball one, right? But if we have a look at the content, you'll see that you know, all, there's lots and lots of bits that go into making that one piece. Okay, and you, the buyer necessarily doesn't not doesn't necessarily want to see all of these things. They're just interested in how many of the one piece items do I have to order for this job? Okay, so you know, the, having all of this stuff is is not only going to make a mess of your reports. It's also going to make a mess of your drawings because you'll get individual part drawings for each of those pieces. It's just a bit ungainly. Okay, so there is a second option. Um, so let me take a copy of all of that um, and let's put that over 600 mil. Let's do that. Okay, so what we can do is, is instead of having it welded, we can delete all those welds, okay, and we can combine this into a single object. Okay, so when we go back to edit, it add attached parts, attach that base plate to there, attach the ball to there, and then attach the rest of the pieces. Okay. And then when we do a numbering or when we check the part, it's still going to have this ball prefix and things like that. And we've got the finish on there, um, but to all intents and purposes, it's one piece. Okay, so if we do the numbering on there um, and we interrogate this one, so this one should be ball one, and this one is going to be ball two, uh, ball, actually, ball five. But when we look in the organizer at that piece, and we, we, we've done it by selection, you can see there's, there's one row. There's only one piece. Um, there's only one piece on a row, and that's all that we need. All right, so um, pretty straightforward. All right, that's, that simplifies the whole process a little bit. Okay. Um, so yeah, so the buyer is getting one row. You know, in their material list, I need this many of these pieces. Um, which is a great way of doing it, but the repeatability here is, is the issue. So how do we make sure um, that that is repeatable? The best way to do it is to put it into a item. So that means you've got to put it to the shape catalog. Okay. So what we're going to do for that instead is we're going to pick these original items. Once you've, once you've configured it and got it set how you want, what you'll want to do is export it as an IC. Now that might seem a bit perverse, but stick with me on this one. Um, what we're going to do here with the name is we're going to give it a name that's going to dictate its profile. Okay, so this could be the product name or something that means, or the, something that makes sense to you. So I'm going to say that's ball underscore 48 diameter, and then it's going to be 550, 550, which dictates the spacings of the balls. Okay. Um, you're going to want to set that as steel fabrication view, which is the best tier of IFC exporting available. I recommend that you do that for all your IFCs, but that's a different topic. Um, and then we hit export, and then that has created that IFC. Okay. Once um, once that's done, we then want to consider importing it. Okay. So we're going to bring that IFC back in. This time, we're going to add it to the shape catalog. So we go to the catalog, go to the shape catalog and we say import, okay? And then all we've got to do is navigate to that IFC, and there's one I did I did earlier, but we want the latest one, so this one here. So we're gonna open that. That's gonna import that shape in as a new shape definition. 
and then that's added. Basically, this is a profile database, so it's added there as a database. And if I pick that, you can see we can, we can preview that 3D there, okay. So yeah, some, some other key information that you can put into here. So you know, you've got this chance to, to tie these attributes to it at this point. So product code, description, version, whatever, manufacturer. Pin that information to this to, to this model at this point, and then it's, it tracks it through its life. Okay, so if we now save that, that commits that to that database, and then we can use it in the model. So to, to put those parts in the model, you're going to go across to your steel tools and go to item. Um, and then you're going to get your familiar interface. Okay, and then... The way to call that shape in is to go to the shape line, which you will notice is different to a steel object that normally says profile, but then pick the ellipses button that brings up that shape library and you can pick your new model from there, the ball standard, okay? So now it's calling it. We're gonna give it a name. Um, we'll probably call it ball standard just like everything else. Uh, material, uh, S275 probably, finish. Um, you might, I'm going to put hot bit galvanize in here, you might want to leave that um, blank depending on you know whether you're buying it galvanized, whether you're getting it as a raw blank. Um, you know, I suspect that if you're wanting to powder coat this you're going to have to put that in there or whatever finish you're going to want to apply. Um, so you know, it's entirely up to you but, but crucially we're going to give it a different, um, we're going to give it a different part number. So let's call the single part SP. Um, and then let's call the main part ball, why not? Um, and then all we've got to do is model that part in, and then you can see we've got this individual piece, which is treated, as far as Tecla is concerned, as a one-piece assembly. Okay, so if we interrogate that part, you'll see it behaves just like any other Tecla structures object, except the profile is, is a reference instead. Um, so let's, let's do the numbering on there. Let's do all of the drawings for this and then we can pass it through to PowerFab and we can have a look at what the, the, the impact there is. Um, one thing I didn't, I didn't do, which we'll go back and do, is we'll quickly have a quick look. Quickly have a quick look. We'll have a quick look at, um, at the organizer report for all of this stuff. Okay, so it hasn't synchronized, so let's synchronize it very quickly. So then we've got three objects now. So you can see the difference. Um, in this report here and if I expand the contents it will be even even more stark. So you can see this is the welded one and you've got a long list of parts that need to go onto that. Then you've got at the top here you've got your um, the one piece um, added material example that we did um, and you can see that we've got a main assembly piece and we, it still numbers it as a as a secondary piece the main blank um, but to all intents and purposes that's one piece. But, and then the one at the top is the reference model. Um, but crucially, you'll see the main difference is this profile. So anybody who's looking at this report is going to be able to tell very quickly that this item that we model as, as an item as from the shape catalog is a buyout item without having to check. Um, these other ones might be a bit more confusing because it's calling in the CHS profile as the main profile. Um, so that's, you know, have a chat with your buyers. They might prefer that. Um, but the, the, the other main point here that I want to highlight is, if you recall, I was talking about making this into a component so that you could share it around. And if you were doing that, you'd want to create a UEL, put that into your firm folder, and then everybody's got to import it. With the shape catalog, it's a little bit more straightforward than that because it's effectively a profile. When you create it, inside your model folder, you're going to, create these, you're going to get these two folders, shape geometries and shapes. Now, in order to distribute that into your firm folder, you need those two corresponding folders to exist in your firm folder. Okay, so inside your firm folder, you'll have a shape geometries folder and a shapes folder. Then, from that point forward, anytime you add any shapes to that catalog, you're going to go into each of these files and take each of those folders and take the contents out and put them in the corresponding folder in your firm folder, which means it's a, it's a really complicated way of just saying that is how you'll make those shapes available to colleagues. All right. Um, I'll pop a link. I'll pop a link here um, to the, the the tech user assistance article for that because I think that'll be helpful for you. Um, but I, I really do recommend that you start considering using that for buyout items. Now let's have a look at um, what that means for PowerFab. Um, very very similar to the organizer. So let's make sure that we've got all of the drawings created, which I think we probably have. Um, but let's just do that again. So create fabrication drawings, 
Yep, let's do that. Um, and then anybody that uses PowerFab will know that we've got to export all of these drawings. So let's select them all. And let's export those. PDFs, yeah. Yeah. Do all of those. And then we've got to export the NC files for everything. All parts, yeah. I think some are skipped. I suspect it's going to be this one. And then we go uh, to export. Go to take a power fab. And that's not loading anything. So let's load that. Let's export that. Yep. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. So we've got number three now, good. So then we bring in PowerFab. Here we go to File, Import. So now we're gonna have a look at what the impact of that modeling techniques have on the buyer in PowerFab. So let's change this to three, let's import that. Let's create a new job. So 21, two, um, let's Call it uh, shape catalog test. Like so let's save that. Let's map that. Let's use the current job. Yeah, we'll overwrite everything. That's all good. Yeah, that's fine. So it's missing some NT files, but that's not too much of a problem. So let's open that job now that we've imported it, and you'll see again similar to what we had with the probe with the the. the report in uh, model organizer you can see we've got ball one which was the you'll remember that was the assembled welded post and we've got a long list of parts which is going to cause confusion inside power fab because you when you come to nest these things and, and order them and stuff like that you'll want to be consuming that material that you don't need to um, so you know best avoided you've got the um, this one here is is the the added material version which is the second best way of doing it in my opinion um, but again similar to what we saw with with organizer you know it's, it's giving you a chs reference which of course is not quite accurate um, you know you, you need to understand what you're looking at here from a from a main mark perspective um, you know you, you'd have to be familiar with it and then you've got the best option which is is the item so the shape um, a catalog item um, which has a shape all its own so it can't be confused for something else um, and it's got a size which a, a purchaser can recognize straight away and hopefully, you know, if, if you're perhaps using the shape as the product reference and um, the person who you're buying these items from knows instantly what they are. Um, you'll also map that slightly differently as well. So you might, you might, want, to, uh, you might want to put that across as a, a buyout item maybe. You don't have to put it in as a ball. You can put the shape as a buyout item to indicate that it is a purchasable item. Um, but that's the way... I recommend you do it. Hopefully what I've demonstrated here is the advantages. It's not to, it, and this is the key point, I guess, is what I'm trying to make is, is that it's not necessarily a benefit to the draft people. Although, you know, you can see there is a speed benefit. It's, it's really the benefit that it has to the people who've actually got to process this steel. Um, that's the message that I'm, I'm trying to get across. All right. Um, hopefully I've wetted you, beginning to whet your appetites with, with power fab. Um, PowerFab is a perfect fit for, for estimators, production controllers and purchasers. Um, it does a lot with inventory, automatically links inventory and things like that. So if you're a Tech Structures users, you, you will almost certainly benefit from PowerFab. So give me a shout and we can, we can talk about PowerFab in more detail. As always, leave me a comment or send me an email, add me on LinkedIn um, if you've got any questions or you want some more information on this. Um, and until next time, Thank you. Thank you for your attention.